Hey guys, it's Danny. Welcome to a new series on my channel, it, which is not new quite at all. It is a Q&A. And I think I started to do Q&As on this channel like in 2013 or 2014. It's definitely not new, but we are bringing it back. And I'm hoping that I can help you with your particular problems with your orchids by answering the questions you leave in my comment section. So before we start with the series, let me tell you how this works. So for this, let's say number one episode, I just picked 10, I think there are 10 questions that I got throughout my channel on multiple videos. But if you have questions that you would like answered, leave your questions under this particular video. It's just making it easier for me to see the questions, although I do get questions on all uh, videos, so I might choose some of those as well. But there is a chance that I will probably see the questions under this video much easier. And also, if you'd like to share videos, short videos or pictures as well, you can just link me to the video or the picture. It just has to be uploaded on a very, very popular other social platform like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, things like that. I'm not going to click on things that I've never heard of before. But definitely if you have your photos or short videos uploaded to Instagram, just link me to them and I will watch them and I will also share with them the video. So you have to be okay with me sharing your photos and videos. If you're not okay, do not add photos and videos. Do not share them with me. Uh, but if you are, do so and I will do my best to answer as many questions as possible in this series. Right, so that's how the series will work. We'll see along the way how it works out. Out. And before we actually get to the questions, this series is sponsored by RepotMe.com. Yes, we've taken the place of myth or truth because I think we busted most of the myths over the past two years. Let's move on to better things. Maybe we're gonna do myths again like in another two years as they appear, but now let's do questions. So the series is sponsored by RepotMe.com who offers you everything you could possibly need to properly take care of your orchid. From potting mixes to pots, fertilizers, accessories, and everything in between. And not only for orchids, but also for other house plants as well, such as cacti and succulents. So I will link you to their website down below in the description. Feel free to check them out at any time. Also, I will share with you the products that I kind of always use around the greenhouse and I really, really like. You'll have all of this information down below and I think also in the pinned comment. And with that said, Let's just start, shall we? First question comes from Dauber Girls. Do you cool the mini fowls only at night or 24 seven? When do you bring them up to normal temperatures? That is a great question. So personally, I do not do much because this room is heavily influenced by the temperature outside. Hence why sometimes it's a little too cold and I have to use the AC. But what I try to do is give this cool down of at least 17 degrees Celsius at night. And that's pretty much when it happens. In the daytime, temperatures usually rise in the growth space because I have a southern exposure and that warms the place up tremendously. This place is not insulated actually. So it kind of fluctuates up and down just like that. So in the daytime, everything becomes very warm. In the nighttime, everything becomes cool, close to the temperature that I have outside, maybe a little warmer. So I don't regulate this temperature to have it all the time. There have been tests on Phalaenopsis, which were done having a low temperature all of the time, and that worked out beautifully as well. But I cannot do that. I can only offer the cool down in the nighttime because that's when it's cold outside and that works beautifully as well. So if you can provide it at least in the nighttime, that's great. If you can provide the cool down like all day long, apparently that is okay as well, according to the studies performed by the Michigan State University, I do believe. How long do you have to cool them down? Well, at least three weeks, I would say, to initiate flower spikes, but the more the better. And I do observe my orchids that sometimes after the first three to four weeks, I do see one flower spike, but then as I continue with the cool down, I see another and another. I do believe that the length can influence the number of spikes, you know, amongst other things. So if you can keep them longer in that cool down, maybe a month and a half, two months, I think you might actually get more flower spikes, but you will also slow down the growth of the flower spike. So, you know, pros and cons, I believe, but I have no choice. Like as long as it's cold outside, my orchids are cold as well. 
and when do I bring them up to normal temperatures whenever the temperatures outside go up and typically winter winter for me lasts about two months and then everything is spring again it goes back to spring temperatures but I do remember when I was in Romania I left them like in the cool down three to four weeks or so and then I brought them um, in that was until you know the balcony was kind of warmed up as well um, so I think it's a bit of a trial and error that you can do I would say cool them for three to four weeks if you can longer try it if not bring them in to the warm side of your house and see how the flower spikes grow and each year you can do some experiments you know I think it's gonna be really fun but I hope that I answered your question this is just how it happens here in my environment at the moment some years you know are different than others some years are not that cold it just really depends but I would say you know the cool down if you can provide it at night it's all you need don't hassle to like provide it all the time if you just can't Righty then, next question from David on food scrap connections, sorry, concoctions. Example, potato skins and water that will extract potato starch which does contain NPK. Why is it not suitable as a fertilizer? Okay, so there is a very big debate or discussion that I can have on this, but for the sake of all of our times, uh, I'll keep it short. Anything that needs to break down into certain chemical compounds such as nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and not only those, in a chemical combination that is stable. I'm not a chemist, it's just like my side quest that I'm trying to learn. So there are some special formulations, chemical formulations, in which nitrogen needs to be found. You cannot like just have nitrogen. Nitrogen is a gas. So you cannot contain it and give it to the orchid. It's kind of everywhere pretty much. So you have to have it associated with other chemical formulas such as um, ammonia, NH4, right? Nitrogen, hydrogen 4. The bottom line is you have to have these elements in specific chemical formulations. Naturally, those actually occur by the influence of nature itself. But when we take that natural setting and put it in a pot, we will find it doesn't work like that. Do you have worms in your orchid pot? No? Hmm. So what we can do is put the potato in there and hope for the best. And what happens is we get molds, we get fungus, we get which again are very natural stuff, but it's not necessarily what we want. So that's the problem with household concoctions. We don't know, generally speaking, not even me, we don't know enough chemistry to make them work. Even if some fertilizers are derived from organic matter or mineral matter, usually they're made by people who know chemistry, <laughs> not us. I know it's fun to see some TikToks that say, put rice water, put potato starch and some banana peels and poof, you got the best fertilizer of life. Is that person a chemist? I would take a wild guess and say no. Do they know how chemistry works in this regard? Again, I will take a wild guess and say no. So why should I trust that person that they know what the heck they're talking about? You know what I'm saying? I had a viewer say that they had an explosion of either fungus gnats or fruit flies or something in their pots and I was like, oh my goodness, they're everywhere in my living room. So, you know, together with that beautiful, wonderful NPK comes a whole lot of things that you do not want, which again have to do with chemistry and I will not dare to go much further than I already did because I'm not a chemist. It is my side quest and I'm trying to learn things, um, but yeah, that's why I personally do not promote these household concoctions to people. Next question from Trish. Help, I can only afford one set of grow lights. Should I invest in the pinkish white or yellow? And this is about the barinas. I wish they sold sets of both. Thank you for help. For your help. Uh, I think that would be a great idea to sell both yellow and pink barinas. But you see, not everybody likes this combination. It's just the thing that I do. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it has to do with the grow lights that I use. They're Amazon grow lights. Um, and I like the combination of yellow and pink lights. Can you use one or the other? Absolutely. Will it look good? I don't know. Depends on uh, your preference. And should you invest in pink or yellow? It's really up to you. What do you like to see more? If you don't mind the light pink light and it's not a purple light, it's a nice pink light. If you like the pink light, that will work. But if you want something cozier for your home, uh, your living room, yellow is cozier typically. The bottom line is orchids will grow they will get whatever they can from that light. You can even use kitchen light, they will grow. I don't think orchids are as picky. If you guys remember, first I bought the pink burinas and I had them for a year in my cabinet and the 
uh, my phalaenopsis were under them. They grew just as well. It's all about what you like to see. I would say the pink one is not really home friendly. It's, it's kind of pink. I personally don't like that pink color. Yellow is a lot cozier and might go with your other light fixtures, right? So it's really up to you. Okay, next up, a question from Blaze13. I am a Repot Me customer. Thank you for your informative videos. I'm happy to assist. Yes, Repot Me are much older than me actually on the market. I have a question of what to do when the roots start growing out of the slots in the pots. Well, I don't do anything. I just let them grow. Most of the orchids we have are epiphytic. And let me just get an example to show you how unruly these orchids can get. There we go. And this is actually a mild example. I chose this pot to show you that even without those slits or those holes, you can get roots growing outside of the pot everywhere. Orchids will do that. No matter what type of pot you are going to use, they will have their roots either stuck to the pot, either coming out of the drainage holes and so on and so forth. And I personally do not do anything about it because I would waste my youth <laughs> on trying to contain the roots. Some orchids produce so many roots that you will not know what to do with those roots. Just let them be, it's fine. As long as you have some roots inside the potting mix that will absorb that water, that's great. These Epiphytic orchids are naturally programmed to put their roots pretty much everywhere and to anchor themselves as best as possible. The way to do that is by spreading the roots in all directions. When you translate this into a pot, you can get some weird behavior. We consider it weird, but it's just not weird. It's how orchids work. And the pot and the potting mix is used just for our benefit because it's much easier to provide proper water in these pots. Now I'm using these nursery pots because I have a million orchids. Not really, but I have a lot of orchids and you know, things can get quite costly for me. Um, but I also have a warm climate most of the time so I can get away without those slits. Typically for most homes and especially for beginners, the transparent pots with slits or holes are better because you can better read the orchid. You better know when to water and so on and so forth. Um, so that was just a side note. But on the topic of roots going everywhere, they will do that. I would not suggest you cut them. Just don't, because they either can get infected, either depending on the orchid, the root might not take it well and start to die off all the way up like cattleyas. I would never purposely cut roots of cattleyas just because I don't like them. Cattleyas are a little temperamental when it comes to roots and temperamental is like putting it mildly. So just let them be. I think they're a little wild, you know, look at it that way. They're wild. They give a certain dimension to your orchid. They can get stuck to things, so be careful with walls and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's fine. I personally don't do anything and I don't know what to tell you what to do about them because I wouldn't do anything about them other than making sure they don't get stuck on the TV or something or start to destroy your wall. You know, just move it a little, get the root, you know, it's trying to grow on the wall, just put it like behind a pseudobulb or something to grow on the other direction. Manage it like that if you think it's gonna spoil something in the house. Other than that, you don't need to do anything about them. Next question from Joe Murphy's Guitar Lessons. How do I encourage roots in the pot as opposed to air roots? As I have so many air roots, but very few in the pot. Right, so air roots are absolutely normal. As I was saying, orchid roots will grow pretty much everywhere and air is one of the places where <laughs> they can start to grow. But if you think you don't have enough roots in the pot, that might mean that the potting mix might not be good. And it's not necessarily that the roots just evade the pot, but it could be that whatever root tries to go inside the pot just dies off. Now, typically speaking, I have not observed this phenomenon, but I would not be surprised if enough roots go into the medium or you already have roots in the medium and they start to die off. Maybe that can actually signal the orchid that that particular region where they grow is not suitable. So it's trying to put out the roots outside. It is a theory many people have. I cannot say if it's true or not because I didn't do enough experiments on it, but it's a thing to think about. In any case, you might actually have quite a bit of roots in the pot, you're just not seeing them, or you might have had roots in the pot and they're just not alive anymore. So if you are concerned, just take the orchid out of its pot and inspect the root system. It might be mushy, it might be absolutely fine, or it might not exist. 
at all. Case in which what I would suggest is repot the orchid into fresh potting mix. Orchids should be repotted periodically every two, three years, depending on the potting mix. So that's what I would do. First of all, just take a look inside the pot and see how you're looking there. You might have a nice surprise, you might not. In case you don't, repot the orchid into fresh medium. Next question from Mostly I See. Here is the thought, this is a bit of a longer one. Once an orchid blooms, what if you then reduce the light? Will the flowers last longer? I started wondering after observing that my orchid seems to lose its fragrance when I let my house get too cold, but after I turned the thermostat back to normal, the fragrance came back, so started wondering if aging itself could be slowed or what to do to control it. Um, wait, you're telling me two ideas here. So first off, what happens or do the flowers last longer if you reduce the light? No. So the chain reaction is like this. We have light that enables plants and orchids to photosynthesize. Through photosynthesis, they produce their own food. And that food is what channels the growth and all the structures, including flowers and flower spikes. And they keep them alive. So if there is light, there is food for the orchid to maintain everything alive. If there is no light, there is no food, stuff will start to die off and the first things that go are buds then flowers and then leaves and then roots and we don't want to go there but the first stuff that go out are the blooms because they're non-vital structures so no do not reduce the light of a blooming orchid but then you say something about the temperature that is a whole different story yes indeed Temperature can affect the longevity of flowers because usually temperature affects the metabolism of the entire orchid. So food is still produced, respiration still happens, everything works, but at a slower pace because of the lower temperature. In high temperatures, uh, respiration, water absorption, everything is at more elevated rates and things just get spent faster. So if you do want to promote longevity of flowers, yes, controlling the temperature can be a good solution. Just don't go too low with it. Furthermore, if you want to know what can help you maintain flowers on your orchid longer, check the video that I will link you to down below. I do have a video about it. But to answer to your question, light does not promote longer lasting flowers lower temperatures do. When it comes to the fragrance, uh, that is just an adaptation of the orchid because usually when the temperatures are low, um, it means you know pollinators are not necessarily in full swing, so there is no reason for an orchid to invest energy into scent. Scent is primarily or only produced for pollinators, for attracting pollinators. If pollinators are not active, then there is no need for scent and the way an orchid, quote unquote, nose, pollinators are not out, is temperature. Another way would be light as well. So in dark light you will notice some orchids do not release any fragrance except for the night scented ones. So I hope I answered your question. Do not keep blooming orchids in the dark because you might have the flowers get spent faster. Next question from Heather. My Phalaenopsis has rebloomed, but all the buds, three so far, on the right side of the flower spike shriveled, while all the buds on the left side so far have bloomed. Is this weird or usual? Well, it can be, yes, bud blast can be usual, especially in new orchids. But if your orchid is not new, oh, and you say it has rebloomed, then it might mean that you're lacking something. It could be light, it could be water, it could be something that affects photosynthesis. Or you might have like a culprit on one of the sides of your orchids that just dries buds, like a radiator or like a hot draft or even a cold draft or something that affects the buds. So yes, it's, I, I would say it's usual. Sometimes, you know, you don't have control over the buds. If it's a new orchid, you just brought it um, into your home. Who knows what that orchid has been through. But if it's not that new, that maybe there is something in your environment that affects the buds. Next question from Annette. What kind of potting mix would you recommend for hot, humid environments? I heard your recommendations for cold, humid and not hot, dry. Well, it's trial and error. Environments, you know, it's hard to put them in categories. I just mentioned a few just to give some examples, but you know, there are many categories of environments and what you can do is trial and error. 
So think a little bit about your environment. Yes, it's hot, but it's also humid. How humid? Because the thing is, even if it's humid, it doesn't mean that water cannot evaporate. If it's 99% humid or 100% humid, like Florida sometimes, yeah, you know, water doesn't really evaporate. You should go maybe for a very aerated potting mix like pot, um, bark or even charcoal, something that doesn't retain water because you already have 100% humidity. Vapor will start to become liquid and it will pretty much hydrate the orchid. But if your environment is hot and humid as in 80%, that only means that the air can still hold humidity. So water does still evaporate and the hotter it is, the faster the water evaporates. So trial and error because it's really hard to know exactly the particularities of your environment. If you are concerned that you might have too much of a humid environment, go for a very breathable mix like bark, charcoal, leka, or a combination of these things. Or, um, For example, Repotomy for Phalaenopsis has a potting mix that has uh, bark, leka, or pumice, or things of the sorts. Things that, especially pumice, they can retain some water, but not too much, and are just very, very breathable. That can work in humid, very, very humid environments or very cool environments. But you might also benefit from something with a little bit of sphagnum moss. It's just trial and error. Um, so just make a leap of faith and use something and see what that experiment tells you because it's just you know you cannot have a straight answer i've tried along the years i don't even want to tell you how many potting mixes or potting styles i've tried they're all documented and many people are upset with me because i tend to switch them every few years it is how it is it is how the hobby goes if you don't like it you know maybe it's not the hobby for you but it is how it is it's trial and error something can work but or many things can work but they can make you like lose sleep over them and just you know tire you to such an extent that they're just not worth it i could grow my orchids mounted i can i absolutely can everybody can but i'll have to water so many times a day i will practically not have a life i, I would not be able to sleep you know so you have to take that into account as well when you're trialing certain products or certain combinations and that is fine it's just the name of the game and don't look at it as a negative look at it as an exciting thing as a positive thing okay keep something for a year see how it works out can you improve it maybe you can let's do something a little bit different see how it works out you know it keeps the interest going alrighty next up Hi Danny, please help. I have a Phalaenopsis for two years and everything was perfect. I repotted this year after all the blooms were gone and a new leaf started to grow. I do not know what went wrong, but I have lost five leaves after that and the roots do not look good. It's not mushy, but there are a lot of black, very dry, not plump at all roots. I cut them and repotted again, but there is no sign so far that I saved my orchid. I also noticed this new medium, wood bark, sphagnum moss, clay granules, coconut choir, get dry, gets dry very quickly. I need to water my orchid every three days. While in the past, I watered the orchid on a weekly basis, sometimes 10 days. I know this might not be something I should worry about, but what caused the yellow leaves and dead roots and what else can I do to save my orchid? Well, I left this for last because this is quite the pickle that's happening here. So first and foremost, the fact that you were watering your orchid every 7 to 10 days and now you have to water every 3 days can actually mean that that particular potting mix is not necessarily suited for you. It's absolutely fine and you can go on watering your orchid every 3 days and that's fine, but if you don't have the availability or it stresses you out, then I would definitely try to add a little bit of sphagnum moss to this mix. It's a brand new mix, don't throw it away. Um, if it dries so fast, it means it's not soggy. It might actually be a very good mix, but a little bit too airy. So maybe add a little bit of sphagnum moss to it, make a sort of a 50-50% and see how that goes. Because dry after three days means you have a pretty warm or pretty dry environment on your hand. That's one. Second, about your orchid losing leaves. Five leaves is a little bit concerning. There are certain instances where you have those very, very tiny seedling leaves. Then you have another set of leaves above, which are not very tiny, but they're still kind of small compared to everything else. If those fell, you know, if you have a leaf like this that yellowed and fell, that's fine. But if there are five big leaves that fell, that can be problematic. And 
um, you also say you have a lot of shriveled roots, I would look inside that pot because you might actually have some issues there. And what I actually suspect is happening is you switch from your old medium in which you had to water every five, seven days or 10 days, you switch to this very, very airy medium and the roots that were used to that environment suddenly had a shock. They dried out so fast that they could not cope with it and they dried and they died, which happens a lot, more than you know. And that's why people say, oh, root rot, my orchid suffered from root rot. Root rot is an effect or an outcome. It's not a disease. It happens due to many reasons, one of which, a very common one, is older roots not being able to adapt to the new medium. And if the moisture levels were so different, that's what happened. So you need to go back in, and see if you have a lot of dead roots. If you do remove them, I think you did that already, do it again if you still have dead roots and also put some moss in that potting mix. If you still have any remaining roots from the old roots, the moss will help it. And what you can do is just let the orchid be and wait for it to produce roots, but you can keep it warm in this time. Don't give it a cool down, don't give it like any anything to promote flower spikes if it has flower spikes cut everything i'm sorry um, but it sounds like the orchid is in a real pickle right now and i'm hoping it's not stem rot those leaves you know they could mean dehydration but they can also mean stem rot i'm hoping it's not but for now put a little bit of sphagnum moss there keep on the orchid whatever root is still good and not mushy hopefully that will help keep the orchid warm give it bright light not direct sunshine but like give it nice bright light keep it warm to promote vegetative growth cut the flower spikes don't let it bloom anymore and i'm hoping this will promote some brand new roots which will grow into this new medium that you're gonna mix now and if you manage to keep your orchid uh, wet for seven to ten days i think that in my opinion that's the golden like ratio between how long a pot can stay moist before it starts to become problematic and how long you can go between waterings and still be comfortable with owning the orchid because you have to water every day and you have a job and you have kids and you have pets and you have all of these things you're just not going to water that orchid that is the reality so the more we can go between waterings the better but not too long you know so i hope this helps out and i hope the orchid is okay and if it indeed is stem rot then it's really hard to treat i don't know how to treat stem rot after so many years it's such a difficult thing because it attacks the very core of the orchid and it can travel from the roots up i think i posted the video with my tulumni already if i did i'll link you to it down below it happened to me it, these things happen um so i hope it's not that but if it is don't feel bad about it everybody has it it's, it sometimes happens and it has to do with many things that have to do with our lives or in your case maybe changing up the substrate to something extremely different. It happens, it's okay, we learn from these things but I really hope that me answering the question helps you out. Right, so that said, I think this is about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Hope uh, this helps you out and let me know your questions down below. Again, if you wanna send me a link to your TikTok or Instagram reel or a photo on Instagram, leave a link there and I will present your video in your case in the next episode. Thank you Repotme for sponsoring this series and sponsoring me for another year. It's the sixth year, fifth or sixth. I don't even remember. My gosh, you guys, how cool is that? I'm so incredibly lucky. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching my videos and supporting me. And with that said, hope you all have a great day and I'll see you next time. Bye.